Chapter Two of At the Villa Rose by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two: A Cry for Help. It was on Monday evening that Ricardo saw Harry Wethermill and the girl Celia together. On the Tuesday he saw Wethermill in the rooms alone and had some talk with them. Wethermill was not playing that night, and at about ten o'clock the two men left the Villa des Fleurs together. "'Which way do you go?' asked Wethermill. "'Up the hill to the Hotel Majestic,' said Ricardo. "'We go together, then. I, too, am staying there,' said the young man, and they climbed the steep streets together. Ricardo was dying to put some questions about Wethermill's young friend of the night before, but discretion kept him reluctantly silent. They chatted for a few moments in the hall upon indifferent topics, and so separated for the night. Mr. Ricardo, however, was to learn something more of Celia the next morning, for while he was fixing his tie before the mirror, Wethermill burst into his dressing-room. Mr. Ricardo forgot his curiosity in the surge of his indignation. Such an invasion was an unprecedented outrage upon the gentle tenor of his life. The business of the morning toilette was sacred. To interrupt it carried a subtle suggestion of anarchy. Where was his valet? Where was Charles, who should have guarded the door like the custodian of a chapel? "'I cannot speak to you for at least another half-hour,' said Mr. Ricardo sternly. But Harry Wethermill was out of breath and shaking with agitation. "'I can't wait,' he cried, with a passionate appeal. "'I have got to see you. You must help me, Mr. Ricardo. You must indeed.' Ricardo spun round upon his heel. At first he had thought that the help wanted was the help usually wanted at Aix-les-Bains. A glance at Wethermill's face, however, and the ringing note of anguish in his voice told him that the thought was wrong. Mr. Ricardo slipped out of his affectations as out of a loose coat. "'What has happened?' he asked quietly. "'Something terrible!' With shaking fingers Wethermill held out a newspaper. "'Read it,' he said. It was a special edition of a local newspaper, Le Journal de Savoie, and it bore the date of that morning. "'They are crying it in the streets,' said Wethermill. "'Read!' A short paragraph was printed in large black letters on the first page, and leaped to the eyes. Late last night, it ran, an appalling murder was committed at the Villa Rose, on the road to Lac Bourget. Madame Camille Dauvray, an elderly rich woman who was well known at Aix, and had occupied the villa every summer for the last few years, was discovered on the floor of her salon, fully dressed and brutally strangled, while upstairs her maid, Hélène Vauquier, was found in bed, chloroformed, with her hands tied securely behind her back. At the time of going to press she had not recovered consciousness, but the doctor, Émile Pétain, is in attendance upon her, and it is hoped that she will be able shortly to throw some light on this dastardly affair. The police are properly reticent as to the details of the crime, but the following statement may be accepted without hesitation. The murder was discovered at twelve o'clock at night by the sergent de ville Perrichet, to whose intelligence more than a word of praise is due, and it is obvious from the absence of all marks upon the door and windows that the murderer was admitted from within the villa. Meanwhile Madame Dauvray's motor-cars disappeared, and with it a young Englishwoman who came to Aix with her as her companion. The motive of the crime leaps to the eyes. Madame Dauvray was famous in Aix for her jewels, which she wore with too little prudence. The condition of the house shows that a careful search was made for them, and they have disappeared. It is anticipated that a description of the young Englishwoman, with a reward for her apprehension, will be issued immediately. And it is not too much to hope that the citizens of Aix, and indeed of France, will be cleared of all participation in so cruel and sinister a crime. Ricardo read through the paragraph with a growing consternation, and laid the paper upon his dressing-table. "'It is infamous!' cried Wethermill passionately. "'The young Englishwoman is, I suppose, your friend, Miss Celia?' said Ricardo slowly. Wethermill started forward. "'You know her, then?' he cried in amazement. "'No, but I saw her with you in the rooms. I heard you call her by that name.' "'You saw us together!' exclaimed Wethermill. "'Then you can understand how infamous the suggestion is.' But Ricardo had seen the girl half an hour before he had seen her with Harry Wethermill. 
He could not but vividly remember the picture of her as she flung herself onto the bench in the garden in a moment of hysteria and petulantly kicked a satin slipper backwards and forwards against the stones. She was young, she was pretty, she had a charm of freshness, but, but, strive against it as he would, this picture in the recollection began more and more to wear a sinister aspect. He remembered some words spoken by a stranger. She is pretty, that little one. It is regrettable that she has lost. Mr. Ricardo arranged his tie with even a greater deliberation than he usually employed. "'And Madame Dauvray?' he asked. "'She was the stout woman with whom your young friend went away?' "'Yes,' said Wethermill. Ricardo turned round from the mirror. "'What do you want me to do?' "'Anno is at X. He is the cleverest of the French detectives. You know him. He dined with you once.' It was Mr. Ricardo's practice to collect celebrities round his dinner-table, and at one such gathering Hanaud and Wethermill had been present together. "'You wish me to approach him?' "'At once.' "'It is a delicate position,' said Ricardo. "'Here is a man in charge of a case of murder, and we are quietly to go to him.' To his relief Wethermill interrupted him. "'No, no,' he cried, "'he is not in charge of the case. He is on his holiday. I read of his arrival two days ago in the newspaper. It was stated that he came for rest. What I want is that he should take charge of the case.' The superb confidence of Wethermill shook Mr. Ricardo for a moment, but his recollections were too clear. "'You are going out of your way to launch the acutest of French detectives in search of this girl? Are you wise, Wethermill?' Wethermill sprang up from his chair in desperation. "'You, too, think her guilty. You have seen her. You think her guilty, like this detestable newspaper, like the police.' "'Like the police?' asked Ricardo sharply. "'Yes,' said Harry Wethermill sullenly. "'As soon as I saw that rag I ran down to the villa. The police are in possession. They would not let me into the garden. But I talked with one of them. They, too, think that she let in the murderers.' Ricardo took a turn across the room. Then he came to a stop in front of Wethermill. "'Listen to me,' he said solemnly. "'I saw this girl half an hour before I saw you. She rushed out into the garden. She flung herself onto a bench. She could not sit still. She was hysterical. You know what that means. She had been losing. That's point number one.' Mr. Ricardo ticked it off upon his finger. "'She ran back into the rooms. You asked her to share the winnings of your bank.' She consented eagerly, and you lost. That's point number two. A little later, as she was going away, you asked her whether she would be in the rooms the next night, yesterday night, the night when the murder was committed. Her face clouded over. She hesitated. She became more than grave. There was a distinct impression as though she shrank from the contemplation of what it was proposed she should do on the next night. And then she answered you, No, we have other plans. That's number three, and Mr. Ricardo ticked off his third point. Now, he asked, do you still ask me to launch Anno upon the case? Yes, and at once, cried Wethermill. Ricardo called for his hat and his stick. You know where Anno is staying? he asked. Yes, replied Wethermill, and he led Ricardo to an unpretentious little hotel in the centre of the town. Ricardo sent in his name, and the two visitors were immediately shown into a small sitting-room, where M. Hanaud was enjoying his morning chocolate. He was stout and broad-shouldered, with a full and almost heavy face. In his morning suit at his breakfast-table he looked like a prosperous comedian. He came forward with a smile of welcome, extending both his hands to Mr. Ricardo. "'Ah, my good friend,' he said, "'it is pleasant to see you. "'And Mr. Wethermill!' he exclaimed, holding out a hand to the young inventor. "'You remember me, then?' said Wethermill gladly. "'It is my profession to remember people,' said Anno with a laugh. "'You were at that amusing dinner-party of Mr. Ricardo's in Grosvenor Square.' "'Monsieur,' said Wethermill, "'I have come to ask your help.' The note of appeal in his voice was loud. Monsieur Anno drew up a chair by the window, and motioned to Wethermill to take it. He pointed to another, with a bow of invitation to Mr. Ricardo. "'Let me hear,' he said gravely. "'It is the murder of Madame Dauvray,' said Wethermill. Hanaud started. 
"'And in what way, monsieur,' he asked, "'are you interested in the murder of Madame Dauvray?' "'Her companion,' said Wethermill, "'the young English girl, she is a great friend of mine.' Hanaud's face grew stern. Then came a sparkle of anger in his eyes. "'And what do you wish me to do, monsieur?' he asked coldly. "'You are upon your holiday, Monsieur Hanaud. I wish you—no, I implore you,' Wethermill cried, his voice ringing with passion, "'to take up this case, to discover the truth, to find out what has become of Celia.' Hanaud leaned back in his chair with his hands upon the arms. He did not take his eyes from Harry Wethermill, but the anger died out of them. Monsieur, he said, I do not know what your procedure is in England, but in France a detective does not take up a case or leave it alone according to his pleasure. We are only servants. This affair is in the hands of Monsieur Fleuriot, the juge d'instruction of Aix. But if you offered him your help, it would be welcomed, cried Wethermill. And to me that would mean so much. There would be no bungling. There would be no waste of time. Of that one would be sure. Hanaud shook his head gently. His eyes were softened now by a look of pity. Suddenly he stretched out a forefinger. You have, perhaps, a photograph of the young lady in that card-case in your breast pocket. Wethermill flushed red, and drawing out the card-case handed the portrait to Hanaud. Hanaud looked at it carefully for a few moments. "'It was taken lately, here?' he asked. "'Yes, for me,' replied Wethermill quietly. "'And it is a good likeness?' "'Very.' "'How long have you known this Mademoiselle Celie?' he asked. Wethermill looked at Hanaud with a certain defiance. "'For a fortnight.' Hanaud raised his eyebrows. "'You met her here?' "'Yes.' "'In the rooms, I suppose.' not at the house of one of your friends?" "'That is so,' said Wethermill quietly. A friend of mine who had met her in Paris introduced me to her at my request." Hanaud handed back the portrait and drew forward his chair nearer to Wethermill. His face had grown friendly. He spoke with a tone of respect. "'Monsieur, I know something of you. Our friend, Mr. Ricardo, told me your history. I asked him for it when I saw you at his dinner. You are one of those about whom one does ask questions, and I know that you are not a romantic boy, but who shall say that he is safe from the appeal of beauty? I have seen women, monsieur, for whose purity of soul I would myself have stood security, condemned for complicity in brutal crimes on evidence that could not be gainsaid, and I have known them turn foul-mouthed and hideous to look upon the moment after their just sentence has been pronounced. "'No doubt, monsieur,' said Wethermill, with perfect quietude. "'But Celia Harland is not one of those women.' "'I do not now say that she is,' said Hanaud. "'But the juge d'instruction here has already sent me to ask for my assistance, and I refused. I replied that I was just a good bourgeois enjoying his holiday. Still, it is difficult quite to forget one's profession. It was the commissaire of police who came to me, and naturally I talked with him for a little while. The case is dark, monsieur, I warn you." Wethermill nodded his head sullenly. Ricardo drew his chair up towards the others. But Hanaud was not at that moment interested in Ricardo. "'Well, then, let us see who there are in Madame Dauvray's household. The list is not a long one. It was Madame Dauvray's habit to take her luncheon and her dinner at the restaurants, and her maid was all that she required to get ready her petit déjeuner in the morning and her sirop at night. Let us take the members of the household one by one. There was first the chauffeur, Henri Servetta. He was not at the villa last night. He came back to it early this morning. Ah, said Ricardo, in a significant exclamation. Wethermill did not stir. He sat still as a stone, with the face as deadly white, and eyes burning on Hanaud's face. "'But wait,' said Hanaud, holding up a warning hand to Ricardo. Servita was in Chambéry, where his parents live. He travelled to Chambéry by the two o'clock train yesterday. He was with them in the afternoon. He went with them to a café in the evening. Moreover, early this morning the maid, Hélène Vauquier, was able to speak a few words in answer to a question. She said Servetta was in Chambéry. She gave his address. A telephone message was sent to the police in that town, and Servetta was found in bed. 
I do not say that it is impossible that Servetat was concerned in the crime, but it is quite clear, I think, that it was not he who opened the house to the murderers, for he was at Chambéry in the evening, and the murder was already discovered here by midnight. Moreover, it is a small point, he lives not in the house, but over the garage in a corner of the garden. Then besides the chauffeur there was a charwoman, a woman of X, who came each morning at seven, and left in the evening at seven or eight. Sometimes she would stay later if the maid was alone in the house, for the maid is nervous. But she left last night before nine, there is evidence of that, and the murder did not take place until afterwards. That is also a fact, not a conjecture. We can leave the charwoman, who for the rest has the best of characters, out of our calculations. There remain, then, the maid, Hélène Vauquier, and, he shrugged his shoulders, Mademoiselle Célie. Hanaud reached out for the matches and lit a cigarette. Let us take first the maid, Hélène Vauquier, forty years old, a Normandy peasant woman. They are not bad people, the Normandy peasants, monsieur, avaricious, no doubt, but on the whole honest and most respectable. We know something of Hélène Vauquier, monsieur. See, and he took up a sheet of paper from the table. The paper was folded lengthwise, written upon only on the inside. I have some details here. Our police system is, I think, a little more complete than yours in England. Hélène Vauquier has served Madame Dauvray for seven years. She has been the confidential friend rather than the maid. And mark this, Mr. Wethermill, during those seven years how many opportunities has she had of conniving at last night's crime? She was found chloroformed and bound. There is no doubt that she was chloroformed. Upon that point, Dr. Pétain is quite, quite certain. He saw her before she recovered consciousness. She was violently sick on awakening. She sank again into unconsciousness. She is only now in a natural sleep. Besides those people, there is Mademoiselle Célie. Of her, monsieur, nothing is known. You yourself know nothing of her. She comes suddenly to Aix as the companion of Madame Dauvray, a young and pretty English girl. How did she become the companion of Madame Dauvray? Wethermill stirred uneasily in his seat. His face flushed. To Mr. Ricardo that had been from the beginning the most interesting problem of the case. Was he to have the answer now? I do not know, answered Wethermill, with some hesitation, and then it seemed that he was at once ashamed of his hesitation. His accent gathered strength, and in a low but ringing voice he added, But I say this. You have told me, Monsieur Hanaud, of women who looked innocent and were guilty, but you know also of women and girls who can live untainted and unspoilt amidst surroundings which are suspicious. Hanaud listened, but he neither agreed nor denied. He took up a second slip of paper. I shall tell you something now of Madame Dauvray, he said. We will not take up her early history. It might not be edifying, and, poor woman, she is dead. Let us not go back beyond her marriage seventeen years ago, to a wealthy manufacturer of Nancy, whom she met in Paris. Seven years ago M. Dauvray died, leaving his widow a very rich woman. She had a passion for jewellery, which she was now able to gratify. She collected jewels. A famous necklace, a well-known stone. She was not, as you say, happy till she got it. She had a fortune in precious stones. Oh, but a large fortune! By the ostentation of her jewels she paraded her wealth here at Monte Carlo, in Paris. Besides that she was kind-hearted and most impressionable. Finally she was, like so many of her class, superstitious to the degree of folly. Suddenly Mr. Ricardo started in his chair. Superstitious! The word was a sudden light upon his darkness. Now he knew what had perplexed him during the last two days. Clearly, too clearly, he remembered where he had seen Celia Harland, and when. A picture rose before his eyes, and it seemed to strengthen like a film in a developing dish, as Hanaud continued. Very well, take Madame Dauvray as we find her, rich, ostentatious, easily taken by a new face, generous and foolishly superstitious, and you have in her a living provocation to every rogue. By a hundred instances she proclaimed herself a dupe. She threw down a challenge to every criminal to come and rob her. For seven years Hélène Vauquier stands at her elbow 
and protects her from serious trouble. Suddenly there is added to her, your young friend, and she is robbed and murdered. And, follow this, Mr. Wethermill, our thieves are, I think, more brutal to their victims than is the case with you. Wethermill shut his eyes in a spasm of pain, and the pallor of his face increased. "'Suppose that Celia were one of the victims,' he cried in a stifled voice. Hanaud glanced at him with a look of commiseration. "'That perhaps we shall see,' he said. "'But what I meant was this. A stranger like Mademoiselle Celie might be the accomplice in such a crime as the crime of the Villa Rose, meaning only robbery. A stranger might only have discovered too late that murder would be added to the theft.' Meanwhile, in strong, clear colours, Ricardo's picture stood out before his eyes. He was startled by hearing Wethermill say in a firm voice, "'My friend Ricardo has something to add to what you have said.' "'I!' exclaimed Ricardo. "'How in the world could Wethermill know of that clear picture in his mind?' "'Yes, you saw Celia Harland on the evening before the murder.' Ricardo stared at his friend. It seemed to him that Harry Wethermill had gone out of his mind. Here he was corroborating the suspicions of the police by facts, damning and incontrovertible facts. "'On the night before the murder,' continued Wethermill quietly, "'Celia Harland lost money at the baccarat table. Ricardo saw her in the garden behind the rooms, and she was hysterical. Later on that same night he saw her again with me, and he heard what she said. I asked her to come to the rooms on the next evening, yesterday, the night of the crime. And her face changed, and she said, "'No, we have other plans for tomorrow. But the night after I shall want you.' Anno sprang from his chair. "'And you tell me these two things?' he cried. "'Yes,' said Wethermill. "'You were kind enough to say to me I was not a romantic boy. I am not. I can face facts.' Anno stared at his companion for a few moments. Then, with a remarkable air of consideration, he bowed. "'You have won, monsieur,' he said. "'I will take up this case. But,' and his face grew stern, and he brought his fist down upon the table with a bang, "'I shall follow it to the end now, be the consequences bitter as death to you.' "'That is what I wish, monsieur,' said Wethermill. Anno locked up the slips of paper in his letter-case. Then he went out of the room, and returned in a few minutes. "'We will begin at the beginning,' he said briskly. "'I have telephoned to the dépôt. Perichet, the sergent de vie who discovered the crime, will be here at once. We will walk down to the villa with him, and on the way he shall tell us exactly what he discovered, and how he discovered it. At the villa we shall find M. Fleuriot, the juge d'instruction, who has already begun his examination, and the commissaire of police. In company with them we will inspect the villa, except for the removal of Madame Dauvray's body from the salon to her bedroom, and the opening of the windows, the house remains exactly as it was. "'We may come with you?' cried Harry Wethermill eagerly. "'Yes, on one condition, that you ask no questions, and answer none unless I put them to you. Listen, watch, examine, but no interruptions.' Hanaud's manner had altogether changed. It was now authoritative and alert. He turned to Ricardo. "'You will swear to what you saw in the garden, and to the words you heard?' he asked. "'They are important.' "'Yes,' said Ricardo. But he kept silence about that clear picture in his mind, which seemed to him no less important, no less suggestive. The assembly hall at Leamington, a crowded audience chiefly of ladies, a platform at one end on which a black cabinet stood. A man, erect and with something of the soldier in his bearing, led forward a girl, pretty and fair-haired, who wore a black velvet dress with a long sweeping train. She moved like one in a dream. Some half-dozen people from the audience climbed out of the platform, tied the girl's hands with tape behind her back, and sealed the tape. She was led to the cabinet, and in full view of the audience, fastened to a bench. Then the door of the cabinet was closed, the people upon the platform descended into the body of the hall, and the lights were turned very low. The audience sat in suspense, and then abruptly in the silence and the darkness there came the rattle of a tambourine from the empty platform. 
Rappings and knockings seemed to flicker round the panels of the hall, and in the place where the door of the cabinet should be, there appeared a splash of misty whiteness. The whiteness shaped itself dimly into the figure of a woman. A face, dark and eastern, became visible, and a deep voice spoke in a chant of the Nile and Antony. Then the vision faded, the tambourines and the cymbals rattled again, the lights were turned up, the door of the cabinet thrown open, and the girl in the black velvet dress was seen fastened upon the bench within. It was a spiritualistic performance at which Julius Ricardo had been present two years ago. The young, fair-haired girl in black velvet, the medium, was Celia Harland. That was the picture which was in Ricardo's mind, and Hanaud's description of Madame Dauvray made a terrible commentary upon it. Easily taken in by a new face, generous and foolishly superstitious, a living provocation to every rogue. Those were the words, and here was a beautiful girl of twenty, versed in those very tricks of imposture which would make Madame Dauvray her natural prey. Ricardo looked at Wethermill, doubtful whether he should tell what he knew of Celia Harland or not, but before he had decided, a knock came upon the door. "'Here is Perichet,' said Hanaud, taking up his hat. "'We will go down to the Villa Rose.'" End of chapter 2